Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome. And let's get right down to business. We'll begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father of light, from whom all good gifts come, send your Spirit into our lives with the power of a mighty wind, and by the flame of your wisdom open the horizons of our minds, loosen our tongues to sing your praise in words beyond the power of speech. Without your Spirit we can never raise our voices in words of peace, or announce the truth that Jesus is Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I'll begin with a reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, starting in verse 14. The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the source of God's creation, says this. I know your works. I know that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich and affluent and have no need of anything. And yet, do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments to put on so that your shameful nakedness may not be exposed and buy ointment to smear on your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and chastise. Be earnest therefore and repent. Before I begin, let me say this to you. Today, with the help of God's grace, I'm going to try to speak with complete honesty. At times, I'm going to be somewhat painfully, maybe even brutally frank. Some of you may not like what I have to say this morning. No matter. Tough times demand tough talk and tough love. If you came this morning expecting to feel the warm fuzzies, <laughs> get onto some kind of an emotional high, I think you're going to be disappointed. If I offend anyone, I apologize in advance, but there are certain things that I believe have got to be said, things that have for too long been left unsaid. And I feel like at this point, we priests have nothing to lose. Okay, 2 Corinthians, St. Paul wrote, My brothers, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? I believe there is a sense of urgency that has got to prevail among men and women of faith if the church in this country is to continue on in any kind of an effective way. If we are ever going to turn this thing around, and one thing is for sure, it ain't going to be easy. Now, unless you've been living on another planet for the past year, you know that the church in America has been most gravely wounded by scandal. Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to compare the church to Noah's Ark, carrying the remnant of the faithful to salvation through the storms of life, the flood tides of evil in the world. And he said that with all those animals in Noah's Ark for all that time, you can bet there were times when it got to smelling pretty bad in there. <laughs> so it is with the church. Things are smelling pretty bad right now. The kind of scandals that stink to high heaven. Now here we are, less than three years into the new millennium, and it seems as though hardly anybody is talking about evangelization because everybody is talking about scandal. Scandals of the most shocking, abominable kind perpetrated by consecrated souls who carried out their crimes often incredibly with a full knowledge of church authorities who simply chose to do nothing to stop them. May God have mercy on them. May God have mercy on their souls. 
As a consequence, the new evangelization we had hoped and prayed for is, for the time being, let's face it, stopped dead in its tracks. It is stalled, it is stuck in the mud, stuck in the mire of corruption. And our new springtime of the church has turned into another cold winter of unbelief. And I don't know about you, but I haven't gotten over it yet. Am I upset about it all? Absolutely. Do I still get angry at times? You bet I do. St. Paul said, who is led into sin and I'm not indignant? Do I want something done about it? You better believe it. Am I appalled by it all? No doubt. Am I surprised? Am I shocked by the whole thing? No. No way. Anyone who knew anything about what has been going on in the church and the seminaries for the past 30 years could have seen this coming long ago. Long ago, it was entirely predictable, and I might add, preventable. But I must tell you that I find my patience wearing thin with those who would minimize, trivialize the gravity, the enormity, the devastating effects of these scandals on the church. Those who take a somewhat uh, nonchalant, cavalier attitude toward it all. For the past seven months, I have been listening ad nauseum to those who will say, Oh, well, you know, we're always going to have scandals. There have always been scandals in the church. and There will always be more of them. You know, Judas and all that. Don't worry about it. Relax. It's all in the cards. Just a little purification that we're going through. God is going to straighten it all out. It will all blow over soon enough. No big deal. Business as usual. But I want to tell you, friends, this kind of talk can be sheer presumption. The idea that there is nothing we need to do to correct this situation right now. Please don't tell me, don't tell me that scandal, moral corruption, dissent, depravity have got to be business as usual in the church, the norm for us Catholics. If we are going to sit back and accept that, there is something wrong with us. Let me use this analogy. Suppose that uh, you're at home one day with your family, and all of a sudden, the kids come running into the living room, shouting, yelling at you, telling you, your house is on fire. What would you do? How would you react to that? Would you just sit there calmly and say, oh, well, you know, there have always been fires. There'll always be more of them. Pyres are a common occurrence. Don't worry about it. Somebody will put it out. God will put it out. Eventually, it'll just burn itself out. Is that what you would do? How many of you would react that way with your home on fire? Friends, the church is our spiritual home and our home is in danger. Yes, Jesus promised the gates of hell would never prevail against his church. But he did not promise it would survive here. And if you don't believe that, think of all those places around the world, all those nations that were once entirely Catholic, where now the true faith is dead. Think of North Africa. Think of all those places in Asia Minor where St. Paul preached. Think of Scandinavia. Think of England, Scotland, Holland, Northern Germany. Don't think it can't happen here. I tell you, it can. Scandal causes the loss of souls. 
And that, friends, is the worst thing that can happen in the order of creation. There is nothing you can name me in the order of God's creation that is worse than the loss of souls. And what are the inherent effects of scandal? Well, first, scandal destroys the faith of weak souls. Scandal destroys the public image of the church and of priests in particular. Scandal makes the work of evangelization very, very difficult, in many cases impossible. Scandal undermines the moral authority of the church. Scandal is like a, a neutron bomb that goes off on the church. You see, the buildings are still standing, the walls are still erect. Well, there is a deadly contamination inside and out. It's a killer. And that is why the saints and doctors of the church were in total agreement. That scandal, scandal involving unchaste priests is the worst thing that can happen to the church. I would suggest to you that a little WWJD is in order here. What would Jesus do? The gospel shows us clearly that our Lord took a very, very hard line against scandal. Some of his most severe words in the gospel were directed to those who cause scandal. Jesus took a hard line. We have to also. St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, taught that the lay faithful have the right, the absolute right, to expect and to demand not only sound doctrine, but good example on the part of the clergy church leaders. And if they don't get it, they also have the right to press for reform and for the removal of corrupt elements. And if we don't do this, I'll tell you what, we deserve what we get. The late Benedictine scripture scholar, Father William Hite, used to say that uh, the Bible shows us clearly that there are two kinds of people that God will punish. God will punish the wicked, those who do evil, and with them the good who do nothing, the good who fail to stop it. Listen, let's understand this. The scandals, the corruption of certain priests and bishops, the unrelenting media coverage, the church's public disgrace since the beginning of the year is a purification. It is a purifying fire that, God willing, will be the good that is going to come out of this mess. But it is much, much more than just a purification. It is also a judgment. It is nothing less than the hand of God upon the church in this part of the world for 40 years of infidelity, corruption, disobedience, dissent, affluence, and I might add, arrogance. That is 40 years of lukewarm Catholicism. We're going to have to be very, very careful lest God spit us out of his mouth. God willing, the damage done by the scandals will purify the clergy, the seminaries, the universities from a certain amount of corruption. But remember, the Protestant revolt, the Reformation, also had that effect. Historians are in total agreement that the primary cause of the Protestant schism was the corruption of the Catholic clergy. The Protestant movement ultimately forced the Catholic clergy to reform itself, but still the damage was done. We live with the terrible effects of the Reformation every day of our lives. The saints have taught us this. St. Robert Bellarmine, back in the 16th century, said, quote, The Protestant revolt is a punishment from God because of the sins of priests. St. John Eudes, Apostle of the Holy Eucharist said, The most sure sign that God is thoroughly angry with his people is when he allows them to fall into the hands of a corrupt clergy. My brothers and sisters, you must know the priests who commit these abominations, 
these priests who do things that would make prostitutes blush are men who have long ago, long ago, rejected true Catholicism. Long ago, they bought into the mindset of the sexual revolution. You see, with the rejection of Humani Vitae, the letter of Pope Paul VI, the reaffirmation of the Church's timeless teaching on the sanctity of human life and sexuality, with the rejection of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments, with the rejection of the virtue of chastity, comes the mentality which holds that sex is merely biological function. Animal activity, self-satisfaction, pleasure for its own sake, fun and game. So why not? Why not get all you can any way that you can? My friend, Father Brian Malady, Dominican theologian, said recently that the scandals we see in the church are the manifestation of the fact that so many priests and bishops have simply stopped believing in the reality of sexual sins. The late Patrick Cardinal O'Boyle of Washington, D.C. said, if they think that way, they're going to act that way. Common sense, right? Friends, do you understand now why it is that so many Catholics have not heard a sermon on sexual morality in more than 30 years? Now, I, of course, am a father of mercy. And the primary apostolate of our order is, in a word, evangelization. Most of us are traveling preachers. We give parish missions, retreats, devotions of all kinds all over the country. In the past 15 years, our priests have preached in 49 states and six provinces of Canada. And I've spoken to pastors all over the country. I've spoken to good, devout lay people all over the country. I've heard all the horror stories. I've heard all the complaints. Chances are there's nothing you could tell me about what goes on in your parish that I haven't already heard. And I want to tell you what they tell me every place that I have been. Number one, our people are sick and tired of lukewarm, watered-down Catholicism. They are sick of superficial, bland, boring, non-committal Catholic preaching. They are sick of being fed bad doctrine, false doctrine, or no good doctrine at all. They are sick of the lack of sound catechesis for our young people. They have had enough. They are fed up with the rotten, rotten sex education programs which do nothing but incite young people's natural curiosity and tempt them to solve it by personal experience. They are sick of the lack of moral exhortation from our pulpits and our classrooms, the lack of any true teaching, tough teaching, about sin, virtue and vice, commandments, confession, etc. They are also tired of leaders in the church who obviously fear to make moral judgments, fear to stand up publicly and tell it like it is and defend the faith as they're obligated by Christ to do. The ones who seem to fear everyone's judgment but God's. You know, moral authority is kind of like muscle tissue. You see, muscle tissue, if it is never used, if it's never exercised, eventually is going to atrophy and die. That's where we are. I can tell you also that our people are tired of shepherds who seem to be more interested in protecting the wolves than the sheep. Our people tell me they have had it, they have had enough of the modernist mush, the New Age nonsense being shoved down their throats in place of the true faith in so many places in the church today. They are fed up with superficial spirituality, the childish, 
Pollyannish spirituality of butterflies, banners, and balloons. <laughs> they have had enough of irreverence at Mass. They've had enough of liturgical abuses, the trivializing, the mishandling of the sacred species. The Council of Trent said, where there is irreverence, there will be corruption. In general, in short, I'm telling you the vast majority of rank and file Catholics as I see it have had enough of the doctrinal and moral corruption in the church and the scandal that follows from it like night follows the day. There is not now, nor has there ever been such a thing as the new American do your own thing, whatever turns you on, good time Catholic Church. All of that is a sham. It's a lie. It's from the devil. It stinks. The corruption of it stinks to high heaven. And if we don't put an end to it, God will, sooner or later, one way or the other. Call it what you will. It comes in many different forms, by many different names, in many different disguises. Call it uh, lukewarm Catholicism, call it cafeteria Catholicism, call it theological modernism, call it liberal American Catholicism, call it rationalism or relativism. Whatever you choose to call it, it is a fatal disease. It is a killer. Ultimately, it leads to paralysis of faith and the ruin of souls. Lukewarm Catholicism in all of its various forms can be rooted in many things. Weak faith, loss of faith, moral laxity, habitual sins, lack of prayer, pride, material prosperity, spiritual sloth, sheer laziness, worldliness, or whatever. But its mindset seems to have permeated everywhere and most everything in Catholic life today to one degree or another. It has crept into the parochial schools, Bible studies, RCIA programs, religious ed programs, chancery offices, liturgical preaching, you name it. A while back I heard about an RCIA program in a parish taught by a couple of nuns. And in one class they were teaching about the Mass and the Eucharist. And at one point they got into a debate with the converts about the real presence. You see, one side was defending the real presence and the other side was denying it. See if you can guess which side was defending the real presence and which side was denying it. <laughs> if you would guess that the converts were defending the real presence, you would be correct. I heard about a religious ed, an adult education program, and a class taught by another nun was teaching the people that uh, we no longer as Catholics believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. She was teaching that uh, uh, the Christians are saved by Jesus and the Muslims are saved by Muhammad, and the Buddhists are saved by Buddha, and the Hindus are saved by Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu, and all the rest, and so on and so forth. The Catholic Theological Society of America recently issued a document saying that we have got to, quote, get over the idea that there is no salvation without Jesus Christ. We've got to give up on the idea that Christ is the only way to salvation. See, these are the rotten fruits of lukewarm Catholicism. It leads to religious syncretism, indifferentism that is. It leads to the idea that not only is one denomination as good as another, but one religion is as good as, good as another, and Jesus is just one Savior among many. This is the deadly error of our time. All of us, sinners in need of God's mercy, need to be honest with ourselves and examine our consciences. If you recognize the telltale signs, if you see some of the symptoms in yourself, if you see it in your home, in your family, in your parish, wherever, please, my brothers and sisters, 
Time has come to do something about it. Make changes in your life. If you haven't done it already, please rebuild your interior life. Please try to be faithful every day to meditation and spiritual reading. Start praying again for God's sake. Start praying again. Pray like you never prayed before. Get on your knees before the Blessed Sacrament every chance you get. Make it to daily Mass if you can. Fast, do penance, invoke the mercy of God, add the chaplet of the Divine Mercy to your daily prayer schedule. It is that critically important. The church is mortally wounded in this country. And I don't believe I'm overstating my case when I say that. Friends, don't put it off. Don't count on others to do it for you. There is no time to lose. Our time may well be short. Bishop Sheen used to say that before the hand of God comes down upon the world, it always comes down upon the church. Surely the hand of God is down upon the church. What's going to happen to the world? God only knows. I fear that it ain't going to be pretty. What is wrong with the church? You want to know the answer to that question, honestly? Let's all take a look in the spiritual mirror. Because when you come right down to it, we are what is wrong with the church. I am what is wrong with the church. Many of you are what is wrong with the church. We did not take seriously God's call to holiness of life. And now all of us have got to light our candles and stop cursing the darkness and try to turn this thing around. It's situation critical. Look around you. Do you need the proof, the evidence that might convict you that God is in reality a low priority in your life and in your family? Ask yourself, is your daily life characterized by spiritual sloth, time wasted, time stolen from prayer, addiction to television, the devil's tabernacle, toleration of sin, Habitual sins that you have grown content to live with, even venial sins? Is there in your life a lack of devotion? Is your life dominated by human respect? Compromise with the world? Silence in the face of sin, error, evil? For example, do you always seem to keep your mouth shut when you hear something said against Christ and His church and our faith, when you're among your friends, acquaintances, and co-workers, do you let your kids stay home when they ought to be at Mass on the weekends? Do you let them miss Sunday Mass? Do you stay away yourself, content to break the third commandment and live in mortal sin? Does your Catholic faith, friend, go down the tubes as soon as you set foot in a voting booth? Do you vote pro-abortion? Do you vote pro-pagan? Do you think God doesn't see? Do you show bad example to your children? Is there lack of charity, fighting, arguing, gossip, and foul language in your home? Do you live the virtue of chastity yourself? Are you chaste, not only in body, but also in mind and soul? Is there a kind of spiritual, functional idolatry that goes on all around you and you don't want to see it? Does the best of your time and your talents and your efforts and your energy always seem to be expended on the chase after more money, more material possessions, Material well-being, honors, recognition, physical appearance, sports. <laughs> God help us. Sports. One of the great idols of modern times. 
You know, if we would seek in the kingdom of God with as much zeal and energy as we use to win at sports, this truly would be one nation under God. <laughs> but as it stands now, of course, we want to take those words out of the Pledge of Allegiance. It's already in the courts. In the Old Testament, God punished the Israelites when they turned to idols. They worshipped false gods. Among them, the false god Baal. We don't worship Baal anymore. Now we worship the god of Baal. Isn't that right? You know, for many it's no longer thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart. Now it's thou shalt love the New York Yankees with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Thou shalt not take the name of the Dodgers in vain. For well, what would it profit a man to win the Super Bowl and lose his soul? <laughs> I'm always fascinated by this. Speaking of sports, you know, whenever a team is, is having a miserable season, losing every game, getting kicked all over the field, the coach will always tell the press that it is a rebuilding year. <laughs> well, this has been a disastrous year for the church. For the church, it really is a rebuilding year. So let's start rebuilding now, right now. I say this, let every man, every woman who loves the church do everything in his or her power to rekindle that fire, that flame of the Holy Spirit, wherever it has been snuffed out by lukewarm Catholicism. Jesus said, I came to cast a fire upon the earth. How I long to see that flame enkindled. You can light that fire. You can start by letting him rule your home again. And then, let's start restoring reverence in our churches. It can be done. Don't say there is nothing that you can do. You can still pray. If they won't listen to you, pray, pray, and pray more that God will change them or move them. It works. I've seen it done. St. Teresa of Lisieux said, Prayer moves hearts far better than words ever can. She said, I know it by experience. Prayer is an invincible weapon, she said. Now I want to read you part of a letter from a courageous pastor in Chicago who decided to do something about it, to restore reverence in his parish. And he wrote this letter to his parishioners, and I want to share part of this with you. The pastor wrote, If we don't believe in the real presence, we might as well close the church and rent out the space. I believe that much of the liturgical experiment that began 30 years ago has failed. We are not holier. We are not more Christ-centered than we were then. In fact, we are facing a generation of young people who are largely lost to the church because we have not given them the precious gift that is at the heart of Catholicism, the real presence of Jesus. Mass has simply become a drama a vehicle for whatever agenda is currently popular. The church building is no longer a place of encounter with the Lord, but a sort of social center, not a place of prayer, rather a place of chatter. The experiment has failed. We have lost the sense of the sacred that before was the hallmark of Catholic worship. The behavior of many in the church is outrageous. When Mass is over, it is impossible to spend time in prayer. The noise level reaches a pitch that one would expect at a sporting event. To kiss a peace seems like New Year's Eve. Christ is forgotten on the altar. The sign of peace in most churches has all the sacredness of an Elks convention. No offense to the Elks. He goes on. We are teaching our children by what we do and the way we are behaving that there is nothing special about that little white round thing. It's just a piece of bread. I remember walking into the church one afternoon to find some of the men of the parish smoking and drinking beer directly in front of the tabernacle as they worked on some liturgical project or other. 
After Mass on Sunday, the church is littered with cigarette butts and gum wrappers, the refuse of snacks and broken toys brought to entertain unruly children and all manner of filth. Therefore, I have decided to restore the tabernacle to its former place in the middle of the sanctuary and to begin a campaign of re-education. A campaign of re-education as to the sacredness of worship and the meaning of the real presence. This means that I will nag and nag until the sense of the sacred is restored. I will be reminding you that a respectful quiet will have to be maintained in church. Food and toys and socializing are welcome elsewhere, but the church is the place for encounter with the living God. It will not be a popular policy, but this is unimportant. The dethronement of the Blessed Sacrament has resulted in the enthronement of the clergy, and I, for one, am sick of it. The Mass has become pre-centered. The celebrant is everything. I'm a sinner saved by grace as you are, not the center of the Eucharist. Let me resume my rightful place before the Lord rather than instead of the Lord. Please, please. Let me return Christ to the center of our life together where he belongs. I commend that pastor. He's got guts. That's what we need in the church today. This is the true spiritual renewal we need in the church today. Friends, let me tell you something. It is painful to have to stand up here and talk about all these awful things that have happened in the church. But I feel like I'm speaking from experience. You know, I have lived with lukewarm Catholicism all my life. When I was growing up all those years, I can tell you honestly, I can't remember ever hearing anything at Mass, anything from the pulpit to get me excited, to get me fired up about my Catholic faith. Nothing to make me want to love more, to know more, to pray more. It seems so dead. It was so rich, so incredibly sublime and beautiful, but so many of us never knew that. I feel like we were cheated of the beauty, the majesty, the eternal truth of our faith, the beauty of our sacred worship. Now's the time to turn it around. We can't repeat the mistakes of the past. I didn't come this weekend to tell you what you want to hear. I didn't come to make you feel good or tickle your ears. I came here to tell you the truth. I honestly came here to get you fired up, to light a fire in you. God said to the prophet Jeremiah, Cursed are those who do the work of the Lord half-heartedly. If you say you love the church and you can't get fired up now, you never will. There's something wrong. I'm going to ask all of you, to do everything in your power, let every man and woman who loves the church stand up, speak up, rise up to put an end to lukewarm Catholicism. And I will leave you. I will leave you with the words of Padre Pio, Saint Pio of Pietrocina, who said to his spiritual children, be firm in your resolution, stay in the ship in which Christ has placed you, and let the storm and the hurricane come. Long live Jesus, you will not perish, what is there to fear? Let the world turn upside down, let everything be in darkness, smoke and noise, God is with us. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Hey, thank you. God bless you all.